You're not selling yourself, you're selling your work. It's Wednesday and you know what time it is. It is time for the Pencil Kings podcast and today we are talking with Kat Rose from thecreativeintrovert.com. Kat, why don't you tell us a little bit about what your site's about, what you're about, and and who you're helping, just to set us up for what we're going to talk about today. Sure. Thank you, Mitch. Um, Yeah, so I'm Kat from The Creative Introvert, as you said, and the idea behind The Creative Introvert was just to share my own experience as a creative introvert and the kind of um, mindset shifts I needed to make to promote my work and to just get stuff done and it all kind of spiraled into this uh ever-changing thing it's become a membership site and all the all this other stuff but at the heart of it is my blog yeah and what kind of creative work were you doing uh, that that you were coming up against these mindset issues because i know you're you have uh, the creative introvert now but i'm assuming it this came out of something else that you were doing before yeah so i had left my uh design agency job um basically because i was finding I just hated being in an office, but if I'm really honest with myself, hated the commute, all that stuff. And I always wanted to be an illustrator, really. But I'd been steered down this route of design thinking that's the sensible thing to do. But in my heart, I just wanted to draw quirky little animals. So that was my sort of task. I, I gave myself six months to see what I could do as a freelance illustrator. And I I, I did find it hard. Um, I had this kind of like, web design background and all this social media marketing stuff that I knew about but when it came to actually getting in front of real people and networking and talking about what I did that's when I really struggled and a friend pointed out to me because he was saying you know you're not shy it's not that you you know when you come to networking events you're fine but you kind of burn out after an hour or two uh, it's because you're an introvert. And I was like, what's an introvert? <laughs> Does that just mean oh. I'm shy? And so, you know, this opened up this conversation about introversion and what it actually is. It's it's not shyness. It's energy, really. It's, it's where you source your energy and how you think, your preferences. Um, and I just got fascinated with that. Um, even if it sounds a bit horoscopy, <laughs> I quite like the studies behind personality typing. So I guess I started drawing connections between my own experiences and the people around me, um, the other illustrators and designers and animators who were also sharing the same kind of problems with talking about their work and, you know, getting burnt out at networking events and just not really enjoying that side of things. So, yeah, I was like still doing illustration, but just getting more and more into writing and blogging and talking about this stuff. Oh, cool. And I, I can really relate to that. I, When I was living in Germany last year, I would go out with um, uh, my girlfriend at the time and, and, the, and the family that I was, uh, or her family, and everybody would be speaking in German. And after three hours, I would, like, I would listen really intently to try and learn the language. And I would realize after three hours that uh, my brain would just kind of switch off and I would become extremely tired and disengaged. And I thought that it was my brain processing the other language, mm. which seems like, OK, that makes sense. But then over the holiday season, I realized I was with a, a different family for their New Year's party. And same thing after three hours, like for you, you said about one out, one to two hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it's three hours. It's just this magic yeah. number that it doesn't matter what language it's in. It's just I can only handle about that much, and I feel like it's a skill that could be trained to extend it. But now, realizing this, I can make a change and just say, like, I will attend this event for three hours, Mm. but I'm not committing to being there longer than three hours. If I'm having fun, maybe I can stay longer. But, uh, yeah, I just get really tired of of the small talk. I, I feel like if it's something I'm engaged in, then I could probably talk for hours, like entrepreneurship. Um, I could probably talk for hours about, you know, beyond the three. But um, for me, it was a really powerful realization. And, and it's awesome because now I can just say no. I have a reason to say no to, hey, want to go and do this thing all day? And it's like, um, I, I'm busy that day. You know, I'm fake busy. But but I can come for three hours. And, and then 
leave it open to myself if I want to stay or not. But then I have an out and just like, oh, I have to go to the other appointment. That's it. And it, it, it's complete. It's not like saying, oh, I just don't find these people interesting after a certain amount of yeah, time. Not at all. It's like the conversation can even still be super interesting. But if your energy isn't there, then you can't give your all. And after that, it's like, how can you manage yourself? So if I do have a busy day and I know that I'm spending a lot of time with people, then I'll have to add in some buffer time to kind of just recoup. And it doesn't have to take like days on end unless I'm really like <laughs> partying hard for a week or something, which happens pretty rarely these days. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it's it's really helpful, I think, for us just to be aware of these things. So we'll come, come back to this because I think this is where you're an expert. But I'm curious about how that six months went because for me, the more that I understand – um, the people inside Pencil Kings, the artists that are working there, their goals and aspirations, uh, as well as like pairing those with actually getting paid. Uh, I see a lot of people who do want to uh, switch and become illustrators. And I feel like it's so nebulous, whereas with design, it's really easy, or at least from where I sit right now, like it's businesses have design needs mm. all the time. Like they have websites that need to be designed, advertisements, flyers to go out, um, postcards, newsletters, all this stuff. And it needs to look good. Yeah. And so that's, it's a very clear business case. But with illustration, like it, it feels like it's nice to have. Um, and so the first question I had was, for those six months, did you, you left your studio job and you saved up some money. So you're just 100% focused on illustration for six months? No, it was like, I, I had design work coming in from like agency so I was doing a bit of freelance design in fact that was how I was really getting the majority of my cash in um, and even that was hard you know I, I really do put it out there to all the freelance designers the first six months is hard I didn't have any um, contact save up so that was all quite tricky but at least it was there like you said there is this general need for design um, with illustration I had no chance. I, I I think I had an agent for three to six months or something um, at the very beginning. Uh, didn't really find that very helpful and just a bit expensive. I mean, I was paying her a, a fair bit for nothing. Um, and so I set up this pet portrait site. Um, I was making T-shirts and that was going OK. And that's where I think I really like cut my teeth because I was really like, this is a passion project, but it, it's still one that I, I need to work now now that I'm on my own and yes I've got design but for illustration to start bringing the cash in that I just need to make it work and I was lucky that I got to work with the Prince's Trust which is an organization over here that will help 18 to 30 or 35 year olds uh, with the kind of business end of things so again I was learning about that and I guess this whole time was just a learning experience and it kept going so yeah after that six months I was like yeah no this is this is fine I'm bringing in <laughs> enough to pay my rent, basically. So I Through the illustration? No, this is still design, but, okay. but the illustration was picking up slowly. But what I did learn, that it stopped being fun. Um, this is just my experience, but as soon as it became like I had clients who, you know, draw my pug or whatever, it, it was less fun. So I, I always kept up my design in that time. And I, I think that's part of the reason why I've basically dropped illustration altogether other than a hobby now. But yeah, so it, it was it taught me a lot. But at the same time, I worked out that it was for me best suited as a hobby and keep the freelance design stuff as the day job. Yeah, I I, I feel like it, it's so hard and I, you know, I don't want to dash people's dreams, but I, I see these unrealistic expectations like I just want to draw my own things but it's like nobody wants your own things yeah. like you want them um, and I think that there you can do your own stuff and, and build a following and then there's a there you like you have to create that demand for your things because you see all kinds of quirky things selling online but what you don't see is how long it took to get there mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of times there's no you know, you're, you're doing your little anime drawings and there's no tangible need. Like yeah. Nobody wants or needs those right now and you have to create the want for it. But that's where it's like, oh, it's going to take me a year or maybe two or three years to build a demand for my own little quirky things. 
I don't want to do that. I got to, how am I going to live? It's like, yeah, exactly. You know, you have to start thinking more strategically. Like how, how is, or what, how is what you doing going to solve a problem that someone has? And, and the problem could be as simple as like, I want to design, make my house have a better design, but that's that the, the amount of pain that's in that problem right. is like so small compared to a business like, oh, we've got a Christmas sale and, and our designer just quit. Well, that's a huge problem and they need to solve it right away. And they're willing to, um, you know, bend over backwards to solve that problem. And that's where when you have those skills that high pain point and that businesses need where they're willing to pay, it becomes much easier. And that's exactly the problem I ran into. And I started learning at the Prince's Trust. I, I, as soon as I started realizing, yeah, I have to start treating this like a business. And oh, I have to understand <laughs> what the hell a business really is. And uh, it, it was definitely a learning curve. But I mean, I wouldn't discourage illustrators or designers. Well, let's talk about illustrators. Like the fact that if that if anyone's prepared to treat their work like a business, and you know, like you said, find those pain points, then brilliant. But I think it's it's for the people who expect it to be just this wonderful thing of, oh, I'll just draw for the rest of my life, which there are unicorns who effectively get to do that, I'm sure. But it's it really is hard. And I think to kind of have realistic expectations is, um, yeah, it's, it's the tough medicine, isn't it? <laughs> so let's go back to talking a little bit about what you've learned in the time that you've been running uh, The Creative Introvert and the people that you've been working with uh, and some insights, because I'm always interested in learning about the psychology of artists and I'm sure there's a book out there that I could read that would tell me all this stuff but I don't know what that book is and so how I learn is just from personal experience which comes slowly over time um, and I'm sure for you you've had some amazing insights with just thinking about the stuff and going deep in it um, yeah. yeah so lay it on me I'm I, I, I want to know what you've learned sure well I think the first thing that came to mind I don't actually talk about very much but the idea that when I did start talking to the other creative introverts that I was meeting and meeting online, that we we were all having these other, we'd have some common problems, but then there would be other little things that I personally might not struggle with, but somebody else would. Like, I don't really procrastinate that much, which is like good for me, cool, but I know a lot of people who do. So I was trying to work out ways of you know, overcoming that, but it's kind of hard when you're not massively struggling with it. However, the stuff that I was really struggling with, like, yeah, talking about my work um, to somebody at a networking event, I could work on that for myself. And that's the kind of stuff that I could really share with the people I was talking to. Who were like, yeah, no, that's exactly how I feel. And this is the thing. And I think just some like common things that I think a lot of people um, struggle with, just creatives in general, uh, like the imposter syndrome. I wrote a bit about that once I discovered that people like Tom Hanks suffer from it as well. I was like, oh, this is not reserved for, you know, people like me who might be starting off in an industry and don't know too much about it. This is what people who have been doing this thing, this craft for years are, are actually struggling with. And uh, and kind of like working through that. Yeah, that was imposter syndrome was something that I, uh, for the longest time, it's weird that with when it came to art, I just knew that I would become a video game artist, and there was no doubt in my mind. And I've talked about this before how there's like a, even though I'm a, a hardcore introvert myself, there's like this confidence that bordered on cockiness, and uh, I was watching a documentary about strongmen on Netflix and he was talking about how you need that like and how Arnold Schwarzenegger was so cocky but that allowed him to do these amazing things and if you want to to perform at a really high level you need that like you can't be have this self-doubt however when it comes to running pencil kings and building businesses that's where all of a sudden this I don't have the same cocky confidence. I've had too many things blow up in my face, fail, um, just just so many things that and, – and it's weird because with art, there was none of that. It was just full steam ahead all the time. And I think what's interesting from where I sit now is that I can really relate to where the artists are through my experience with business mm. but then still give them the confidence of that cocky artist of just like, you know, JFDI, just effing do it. 
um, that, that, <laughs> and, and make things happen. That's so interesting. I, th- I think um, I've been writing a bit about this uh, recently, just how confidence, you have it in different areas. It's not this overall thing. But I kind of see it as this thing that you can like take some confidence from one bucket and put it into another, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be this this thing that we are told fake it till you make it like oh my god I hate that expression so much because most people aren't very comfortable with faking things so you know for you for example like you said you know what that feels like to be confident in one thing so you know how can you apply that feeling it, it, I don't know <laughs> it's kind of hard to describe but but do you have a tangible example or something where you've uh, taken confidence from one bucket and put it into another one or, or somebody that you've worked with yeah. um, that maybe the, the people listening, they could gra- gravitate towards and be like, oh, well, I th- yeah, I see how I'm like that where with my art, I'm maybe not that confident or there's, there's some sticking issues. But in some other area, I, I have no problems at all. Yeah, well, for me, it's it's looking back at past experiences. And I think, okay, well, I survived that thing, which I did not feel confident about. But, you know, I, I didn't die. I, I, For example, public speaking was something that I thought I would never do. And slowly but surely, I was like, well, you know, if I can make a quick video on my phone of me talking to it, this is when I, I was on Periscope. And again, that took me ages to build up the confidence to do that. But it was all like little baby steps. So making a video that didn't go out to anyone, then I would get live, go live on, you know, whatever it was, Periscope, Facebook Live for, you know, once, uh, one minute every day for a week. And then slowly I was thinking, okay, well, if I did that thing, then maybe I can join Toastmasters, that, you know, big speaking group. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have to be like the next day you're doing something really extreme but if you can just create some evidence for yourself to prove that you can do this thing then you can take that next step if that makes sense yeah so just using these little bits of experience baby steps yeah and and like uh, noting those so like i keep a folder on my computer <laughs> like with just you know nice emails that i've received or like little things that have meant okay yeah, I got this many followers that day in March of 2015. You know, like little things that will um, remind you, hey, I've got evidence that I can do these things, which I did think was scary at the time. I'm, I'm curious about th- these videos that you are making because the one of the realizations that I've had recently is how powerful baby steps could be or just like these little things so you said making a video that you didn't show anybody and then doing one uh, like a one minute video live every day for for seven days or for a week whatever um and what i found is that you know we often especially like right now when we're recording this it's just the new year and people are talking about goals and yada 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 and there's all these big aspirations but what if you just had like small aspirations and that's what I've been experimenting with for the last uh, almost 70 days now with fitness. Like I've never been able to stick with anything longer than three weeks and I said, okay, I'm going to sort of start this fitness program and it's only two minutes a day. Like I'm not going to get hulked out or anything doing two minutes of exercise but I'm building that habit and I'm like getting past it and I'm so proud like for me because I'm I was I'm able to get to where I am with consistent daily fitness. I haven't missed a day even Christmas day I did my workout. Um but because I made them baby steps, they're so easy to do. Yeah. And I I think that there's so much power when you're trying to do something that you're um scared at or, or scared about or maybe you failed at in the past or you're unsure of, if you just set the stakes way lower. So I didn't say I'm going to go to the gym and run for 45 minutes a day. That's like ugh. That's this huge commitment. <laughs> yeah. But these micro commitments, you can start to build some momentum and learn a lot about yourself and what you're doing in the process. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because for me, that is everything. Like it's great to have a big overall vision where you want things to turn out or how you want things to turn out. But it's this idea that how small can you break these things down? And even then, like how could you do a bit of that every day? So another thing that I turned into like a daily task was sending out emails and just like to one person, not like batch. 
because I was finding that I would choose one day out of the month to do all of my um, emails. This is back like when I was illustrating, like to creative directors, like one day a month would be my day to like just hit up everyone. And I would end up dreading it so much because after the first hour, my I would be making typos. It would just be a mess. And I just finally worked out that if I just sent one a day, um, even if I dreaded that kind of 15 minutes, and even if I had nothing to say that day, like literally if the email was just, hey, thanks, I read your book and it was really great. It, it was building that habit. And then it just didn't feel like a big deal. And that was super powerful for my business. And just my confidence, I think, as well. Yeah. Yeah, these these, these small daily things, if you're... If you're... I think, and I don't know if other people are like this, but for me, I've, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm this super person. Like I can get so much done. I, I you know, in your example of sending uh, maybe 30 or maybe it was even 50 emails in one day a month, and instead of doing that, just saying like, no, one a day, yeah. that that's easy to do. There's like no reason not to do it. And even if you forget, and you're like, oh, it's midnight. Well, nobody really cares if they get an email at midnight. Like I'm probably not waking anybody up. At this point, we know how to turn our phones off and whatnot. I'll send that so I can hit my daily target of sending one email a day. There's no reason that I not to do this. Yeah, and it feels like because it's so small, um, I don't know if you've experienced this with your fitness, but like just if you miss one day, it, it's okay. Whereas if you miss one day and you're only going one day a week, like that's like, oh crap, well, I haven't been for two, day, two weeks, you know? So even those little emails, well, if I was on a roll, then I would do more emails. I don't, you've probably heard that um, story about, you know, if you just tell yourself to floss one tooth <laughs> a day, well, you know, one isn't that big a deal. So you might end up doing the whole mouth and some days you won't, but either way, it's really hard to fail on that. Yeah, exactly. I, I used to say uh, when I was into running that all I had to do was put my shoes on and leave the house. And if I wanted to quit after that because it was raining or something, then I could and I could go back home. But I, I never quit yeah. <laughs> once my shoes are on and I was out the door. That was the only thing I had to do. Yeah. But it always worked out that then it was, it was fine to go through it. So I want to talk a little bit about who are the people that you're helping and how do you help them specifically? Because I feel like we've we talked a little bit about it and we danced around, but I feel like you have like a, a process or, or some kind of steps that you take people through that really helps them to make a leap from where they are with their introversion. And I, I'm wondering if you can share anything with us. Obviously, we can't get into the whole thing that you do, but um, maybe something that somebody listening to could it could spark something inside of them that they might want to go and, and look for more information or just take with what, what you've said and try it out themselves and, and maybe see some uh, amazing things. So we've already talked about breaking things down into really simple, easy to do uh, daily things, which uh, in my world or in the Pencil Kings world, what we get people to do is we have a sketching challenge. And so all you have to do to complete this challenge is do one sketch every single day. And we don't put any, there's no theme or anything like that. It's not like uh, I know in Inktober, which is a big challenge that people do, there's a daily theme. And when I tried to do that, I was like, oh, now there's too many restrictions. So we just say one sketch a day, even if your sketch is one line on a page, that counts. That That's still enough. In, in my world, that counts as a sketch it's a it's a minimalist, you know, <laughs> very efficient one stroke sketch, but still, and people really gravitate and they're able to do this and, and start gaining momentum. But what are some of the other things that you help people with or, or the process that you take them through? Sure. Um, well, one thing that I believe is still going on is my confidence challenge. And again, this is a seven day challenge that I put out there um, for free. And that was Again, it was kind of scratching my own itch. I, I set myself these little tasks to sort of give myself the boost and like put into action um, the kind of things that I was learning from various books. At the same time, I found a lot of the books a bit too theoretical and not practical enough. Uh, so I wanted to kind of like condense some of the stuff that I was learning from from those into practical steps. I don't know if anyone's read um, Presence by Amy Cuddy probably seen a TED talk but she, basically to me presence translates as confidence so kind of distilling some of her ideas about power poses and even if that sounds like really ridiculous which I think to a lot of us especially introverts we're like no not for me but seriously when you try these things and with an open mind 
and you're like, well, it's just a seven day experiment. If I just treat it that way, um, what can I do? And so, yeah, it, it's stuff like that. These are like practical action steps. Yeah, there's a little bit of woo-woo stuff, but I always <laughs> back it up with some some science or at least some personal experience. And um, yes, so that that was one thing is is running this little challenge. Um, and I guess the, the main thing that I'm doing right now is uh, the League of Creative Introverts. And that started from me interacting with a lot of Facebook groups, whether it was for introversion or illustrators and other creatives. And just thinking, why isn't, well, yeah, again, just selfishly creating something that I wanted to exist in the world. And there are other creative introverts who seem to get use out of it. So yeah, we're sort of sharing like question and answer sessions. We give feedback on creative work, accountability. So I I set buddies up, accountability partners. And I think, again, introverts really like that one-on-one thing. Whereas even though uh, masterminds, I think, are brilliant and maybe that's something we do in the future. But I think just having like one person that you can kind of check in with weekly or something via email or whatever um, has been a huge help for people. So, yeah, it's 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 a bit of a, um, a jumble of things that is always changing. But that's where we're at at the moment. I really love the idea of accountability partners. Yeah. Um, when I, uh, you know, my backstory, I'm sure some people have, uh, are listening have heard this before, but I grew up in this little village. Um, then we got the, the internet, like the internet wasn't a thing. And I think we got it about the time I was 14 or so. And then <clears throat> I think that helped with the introversion because I could be an extrovert on the internet. But meanwhile, in, in real life, I was an introvert. But when I looked back on it, one of the things that I always had were other artists that I worked with who were at roughly the same stage or maybe just a little bit above. And I always showed them my work and and we we showed each other our work, what we were working on and just had lots of random conversations and, and they grew into friendships that lasted years. I, a lot of these people now, I don't know where what happened like with the internet. Sometimes people just disappear and you don't know what happened. They got, they got busy or maybe they passed away. Like anything could happen. But it was a common thing this this uh, idea of accountability and i've also found it too interviewing people that this uh, i i don't know if it universally applies but i feel like it might if everyone really goes back and looks i'm sure there's some outliers yes that did everything just in in sort of like a closet by themselves but there's other people there and what i see though is people trying to do everything just by themselves and or they'll participate in a group, but the group is too large mm. and you don't get the attention that you need. Like you actually need somebody who's there and realize that it's, for whatever reason, it's it's a friendship really and you're helping each other. Uh, so I think it's really cool that you brought that up and that you're doing that in your group. And I'm curious how you're pairing people or how someone who's listening and saying like, oh, that actually sounds really cool, uh, but I don't know – where I could find someone. Oh, actually, you know what? I think where to find someone, there's tons of people on the internet. Um, you can find these people. But how do you find, so let's say you join a Facebook group. There's lots of free Facebook groups for, for drawing. Um, you could join Pencil Kings. You could join Creative Introvert or the League of uh, Creative Introverts. But what is that sort of like that magic spark that says mm-hmm. this, I, this is somebody that I want to work with are you kind of knowing both people and then making the connection because I think it's it's good for people to be self-reliant because it's cool when somebody can say here's the here I did it for you it's it's done but um, not everybody's going to be able to have access to that so what can people do on their own to to find that spark or that connection or, or whatever it is that if they're they've been working on their own and they realize they need to do this that they could maybe move forward with with this idea of finding someone to to share the journey with yeah i think well one thing because i am quite interested in the whole myers briggs um personality typing that is something that i ask my own members who sign up and so i'm kind of trying to pair people who aren't the same so it's the idea that you've got this introvert personality type but you've also got these other preferences and I like the idea of getting two people who are slightly different. They might still be introverts. Well, they probably are if they're in the league. But 
and kind of finding things that will complement each other. So if one person is a big picture thinker, the other might be more an attention to detail thinker. And I think that could be applied, you know, regardless of whether you've taken this Myers-Briggs test, which you can do online for free. um, I think it's kind of worth just thinking, okay, here are my own traits. Here, Here are my strengths. Here are my weaknesses. And can I have a chat with somebody or just ask them a few questions to work out if they struggle with those things or if the things that they struggle with um, are different and that way you can kind of help each other out and be the yin to their yang or whatever so I mean, and that's how I would go about doing it so like rather than just thinking oh I need to meet another illustrator who works in this style maybe it's you're thinking more to do with just your own strengths and weaknesses in whatever whatever you're doing so yeah going on that does that make sense <laughs> It, it, no, it does. And I think it's really cool to use the the Myers Briggs. And if anybody's listening and, and hasn't heard of it or, or has heard of it, actually, there's an amazing website called Sixteen Personalities, which I think for creative people, uh, I I'd taken this test before and it was all text based and it seemed very academic. But on Sixteen Personalities, you can just look it up. It's very visual and mm-hmm. and it's really cool. It's one of the best uh, quizzes I've ever seen online to help you figure out uh, which you are, which personality you are. So once somebody does that, do they, are they then posting inside your private community like, hey, I'm a ENTJ or you know whatever your mm-hmm. type is. And if you don't know what that means, you can go to the site and, and and you will know what these acronyms mean or an INTP. But are they po- then posting that and then other people kind of gravitate towards it or how is that matchmaking? I think that's something like that might have to happen at some point, but at the moment it's just happening all through me. So like they'll fill in a form and I'll be like, okay, we've currently got somebody who's like this, or they might, (laughs) um, if there's an odd or even number, sorry, if there's an odd number, yes, then I'll buddy up with them for like the time being. And I'm open for people kind of switching so that's kind of how we're working at the moment. It's very like fly by the seat of our pants. But at, at the same time, I do love the idea of having um, a central thread where people can just, you know, hey, because it's OK. If, you know, if, if a, two buddies aren't working out, like I, I leave it open to kind of do a monthly switch. So I think moving forward, like maybe at some point I'll, I'll start doing something more like that. So it's a good idea, Mitch. That's oh, very cool. <laughs> And uh, yeah, just remembering how things came about for me, I, I didn't have any matching or anything. And I think what I did was I looked for, I was just on these, uh, it was called IRC. I, I, mm. I imagine IRC still exists. It's called Internet Relay Chat. Yeah. And it was these early chat rooms and these networks that you could get on. And there was um, art chat rooms, which I guess today's similar thing might be f- Facebook is kind of different because you're posting, although I could see how it could be sort of similar um but or, or maybe some of these slack groups that are mm. that are around now that might be something that's uh more like what what actually slack is very similar to what internet relay chat was and i would gravitate towards people who i who were seem similarly engaged so i was spending probably like three to six hours a day on these chat rooms um, which sounds horrible, but this is really where a lot of my art education came from, was learning from other artists in these chat rooms. And I would find people who are similarly engaged, who are doing artwork that I I was excited by and wanted to do more of, and then just started you know, private messaging and, and, and talking and having conversations. But I think that level of engagement is a really important thing because – uh, I see that there are a lot of uh, – well, there's there's artists of uh, all across the spectrum. Yesterday I was talking about somebody who draw, uh, talking with uh, – about someone who was drawing for 16 hours a day, um, and that's really hardcore. And I think if you're somebody who's drawing one hour a day and you're paired with somebody who's doing 16 hours a day, there's going to be a huge disconnect very quickly. Yeah. Um, but if you can find somebody who's on a similar kind of like commitment to it, or just where one hour a day, it's just a hobby, it's something I like to do for fun, um, then that's that's great. And you, you guys can share that journey together and, and discover things um, and, and really pace well. Yeah, that's another one of the questions. It's like, I'm fascinated by goals and like where people actually, you know, everyone's at different points with their creative pursuits or even businesses. So I think... Going by that is another really useful thing to to look at. 
All right, so we're almost at time here. We like to keep these short and sweet, but I feel like there's one, there's probably something that you've learned in the time that you've been working with introverts that has blown your mind. And that when you realized it, it was a real aha moment, even if it m might be sort of common knowledge to maybe the psychology community or something. But I love these insights that we have ourselves just by doing the work, like with if it's, you know, working with your artwork or learning a software or working with people or dealing with your family or your job, anything. But what's a, a, a really big aha moment that you've had uh, since you started The Creative Introvert? So one thing that has been coming up recently that I'm actually trying to <laughs> I'm trying to work on so apologies in advance if I, I don't have a good sort of solution to this but it's the idea that not all introverts um, creatives or otherwise want to be seen themselves right I think it's quite a I thought it was quite a universal human thing anyway just to want to be noticed. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I'm not clear. You said uh, not all creative introverts want to be seen themselves. Yeah, so um, it's the idea that they want their work to be seen, not them. And oh. I think this is something like that can be a bit of a stumbling block. So if we are like expected to promote and our work and like get followers and all of this stuff and get attention, let's face it, it's actually... The problem is that part of us is kind of saying, I want this thing because, you know, that's how I'm going to make a living from doing what I love. But there's another part of us that's saying, actually, I just don't want to be seen in, like myself. So it's the idea that, I, and I think that's where the kind of dissonance gets created. It, it's this, you can't have both it's kind of one or the other and that's why we struggle a bit when it comes to talking about what we do because we're thinking we're talking about like ourselves we aren't detaching ourselves from our work but when we can do that that's when it becomes a lot easier right so the idea that you're not selling yourself you're selling your work and I think that and, and working around that concept and trying to reframe self-promotion as work promotion it feels a lot easier and less stressful in my experience and yeah this is again it's it's an idea that I'm kind of playing with right now like at least the practical steps that would get someone more comfortable with talking about their work and what they do but separating themselves from their work which yeah it's just not easy that's so cool because you know uh, last year we, we had a group of people we were coaching them uh, in getting their art career started, or their illustration career started, or you know whatever they their visual whatever they do career started, and I remember we had a chapter called self promotion, but this idea of work promotion, I really like this. Do you ha do you have any tangible examples of where someone the ideas that they have about themselves is kind of getting muddled in with the work and should be kept separate, like? I, this could be wrong, but um, you know, when I was a kid, I had really bad acne, and I didn't want to go out and everything. But this might, you know, if we fast forward now to where I am now, thankfully my skin is 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 not bad now. <laughs> but um, if my skin was still really bad, I might feel like because my skin is bad that I can't, you know, we'll use air quotes here, self promote. Mm. But actually, it has nothing to do with it. It's like. How you how you look and how your skin is, it does not matter one bit to what you put into the world in terms of your work. Would this be an example or are there other things that are more relevant? No, I think that's a really good analogy. I, I wish I was better at coming up with analogies to make this a bit clearer. But um, I, I guess for me, it, it's kind of working with it on an intuitive level. So it's, I love journaling. And if I'm feeling a bit weird about... Uh, talking about something I have to like ask myself in my journal why that is and I kind of come up with different scenarios and I think about them and then I think okay how does that make me feel and this is getting a bit like therapist <laughs> but this is kind of what, what I think is needed and just kind of coming to terms with like okay what does that feel what does that mean if people don't like my work what does that mean to me okay is it just that they don't like my work or is it something else or does it mean that they don't like me? And 
is that true? How do I know that to be true? And obviously it's it's false. And, you know, it's kind of just opening up this inquiry about this distinction between who you are to your friends and family. Like, if, if you couldn't draw another day, like, of course you'd still be loved. Of course you'd still be part of the pack. And just kind of reasoning through this stuff as best as possible. Oh, I like that. And I, I just have to tell one quick story here, but I know we're going over time, but because... Uh, I, I've heard this advice before, you know, like, how, how does this feel? And um, just as you were, you were saying this, there's things where, um, like, let's say you're not promoting your work or you're not sharing it with people. And so what you could do is ask, why am I not sharing this with people? And um, which which sounds easy to do, but it's not. Like, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't do this or there, or I didn't get it for the longest time. And then one day I accidentally, uh, you know, found myself at a co-working situation where you basically go to a coffee shop and work with some friends and I didn't have my laptop. All I had was my notebook. And I, I was struggling with um, bringing more members and promoting Pencil Kings more. And I, 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 there's like this resistance that was there. So if, you, if you're listening and you think about your own artwork and you're not showing it to people or you're not sharing it or you're not promoting it, um, you could do the same kind of thing and ask yourself like, well, what's, what's really going on here? That's the exact question that I asked. What's really going on with this situation? Um, but I think the key is, the thing that we don't give ourselves uh, space to do this, to sit and allow yourself to get bored as heck and keep asking this question, what's really going on here? And imagine you're asking that question to uh, a version of yourself that that doesn't have any roadblocks. Like I think we could imagine ourselves, it's easy to imagine how successful or how popular or how, you know, whatever good situation we could be. You know, that's why we set these crazy New Year's resolutions and everything because we can imagine that it's possible to have a six pack abs or to draw realistic figures or whatever it is. But when you sit there uh, without any digital uh, um, distractions and you just ask that question what is really going on here and ask that version of yourself who has already done it or who knows the answer and and just keep going keep asking that question again and again and when I did this I, I spent four hours not because I wanted to or because I had some realization that this was the way to do it or, or I read something or somebody told me it's because I forgot my laptop it's something that happened completely by accident and I had nothing to do for the whole day except sit there with my book and ask this one question and I got really deep and what I realized was that I wasn't promoting Pencil Kings because I felt like I wasn't doing a good enough job for the members inside Pencil Kings already and if I added more members to Pencil Kings I would be doing an even worse job because if you imagine um, trying to to please and, and do your best work for uh, thousands of people and then you add thousands more, all of a sudden, it you just can't. You're, you're like broken. And that allowed me to come up with new ways of thinking and how I could get past that problem and get help and the help and support that I need to start bringing more people into Pencil Kings where I could help people even better than I had in the past. But it really came from that four hours. And I, I, I'm not exaggerating. It was literally four hours. I think you could do it in less time. But four hours asking one question. That is so awesome. That's like, yeah, it, that's the dream, isn't it? I mean, we can work, we have all the answers. Um, it's if we give ourselves time and we actually like push ourselves. Because, you know, you could have like <laughs> paid a coach to be like, nope, come on, tell me the answer for four hours. But you just did it, you know, and it wasn't easy. Um, but you can do it. And I choose to do this, like, again, I've made a habit out of it. So every morning I do my morning pages first thing and I, like half the time I'm writing about whatever crazy dream I've just had but um, other times I'm asking myself these questions that I would avoid during the day with busy work but because I know I can't have my coffee until I've done my morning pages <laughs> then I, I end up answering the questions and it's yeah your brain kind of thinks differently at that time of day too. All right well I think that's the perfect place to end. Um, I hope that uh, this has been a good episode. I, I've learned a lot and I want to continue talking to you about the kind of the insights because I'm really, I'm so interested in the psychology because I feel like 
if we can figure this out and, and how it actually applies, that we can unlock a lot of the blocks that people have and just let them live live more creatively. And I think that's a that's an amazing reason um, to be on this planet and and a mission to carry forward that has a lot of meaning. I know when I worked as an artist, I didn't there wasn't a lot of meaning that I felt, but in helping people um, get past these roadblocks, and sometimes it's so simple, um, but it, it's it's powerful. Like uh, you're making the world a better place. I don't know if anyone's told you that. Um, but um, I, I believe that I'm making the world a better place too, and, and it's just simple, and it's uncovering these things and, and thinking deeply about it. So, thanks so much, Kat, for sharing this with us. Any last words or, or URLs that you want to throw out for people to go and, and visit? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, because I think I've learned a lot from the, the, just this show. Um, so, if you go to thecreativeintrovert.com, that's where you'll find all my stuff. Um, and if you stick a forward slash pencil at the end of that, and if you're interested in checking out the League of Creative Introverts, you'll find it all there in a special offer, um, a trial offer for your listeners there too. Awesome. Thanks so much. And if you're listening and, and, and you are more interested in the actual like how-to drawing stuff, uh, we've got our community as well over at PencilKings.com. So come and check us out. Uh, thanks so much, Kat. And I look forward to keeping in touch and, and learning more about what you're learning and how to help people kind of get past these roadblocks because it's so so powerful agreed thank you mitch good demand patience skill years of practice ah, you talk like a fool i would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration